Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful, sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner, and we are still hanging in quarantine, so please forgive any unusual noises in our environments today. So on March 21st, 2020, we broke a record no one wanted to break. By week's end, 3.3 million Americans filed for unemployment as the country takes measures to halt the spread of coronavirus. People are fighting not only for their lives, but for income desperately needed to remain fed, healthy, and housed. Businesses are drastically reducing their workforce, leading economists to throw at the wall estimates for peak unemployment rates ranging from 9 to 32 percent, the latter implying an additional loss of 47 million jobs. And as always, this burden is not equally borne across society. Following 2008's Great Recession, where one in five lost their job, the market changed in many ways. One being the gig economy mushroomed and more people took on temporary, semi-flexible, task-based labor as contractors to shore up income. Meanwhile, employers buckled down to mitigate risk and increase their revenue. So best practices took a backseat to profit. Well, profit's kind of always priority, it seems. But with so many looking for work, companies really got the upper hand and set the terms most beneficial to them, not the employee. High supply of available labor, low demand in a small pool of jobs. While the outlook today has similarly grim aspects, this is not the same as 2008, for better and worse. A positive prospect is that essential workers, like nurses, warehouse packers, and grocery store cashiers, hold more power than ever, and they're using their voice to organize walkouts. We saw this with Amazon's Staten Island Fulfillment Center walking out over safety and sanitation concerns, and GE employees protesting to convert their factory to ventilator production. Concurrently, amid economic uncertainty for both employee and employer, conversations have returned to the issue of livable wages. Did you know for the past decade, the federal minimum has been stuck at $7.25 an hour, a wage many of our essential employees are earning, a wage that doesn't give enough room to build up savings, a wage that implies working paycheck to paycheck to make rent, cover bills, and healthcare premiums. They say money doesn't buy happiness, but if you're scraping by and juggling multiple jobs, or you're unable to get out from being trapped under the pay ceiling despite ever-increasing costs of living, evidence and common sense show deeper pockets can improve your life and chances for well-being. And a growing number of companies aren't waiting for the government to set new mandates. They are instead taking initiative, investing in their employees here and now. Thank goodness. This brings us to today's guest, Dan Price. Dan is the founder and CEO of Gravity Payment. You may have heard of them. A Seattle-based credit card processing system aimed at providing financial solutions to small businesses. Five years ago, he took a massive pay cut in order to raise all of his employees' salaries to a $70,000 minimum, a number that doubled the pay of many on his staff so they could have a quote-unquote normal life. This decision ultimately transformed his company, his staff, and their happiness. He believes business leaders have a social responsibility to take care of both their employees and their customers, and that companies can still be financially successful at the same time, imagine. Today, we get to hear how he does it. Please teach me everything you know. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for having me on, Allison. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you for making time during the Quarantine Chronicles. You went from a yearly salary of over $1 million to that of your average employee. What was the catalyst for increasing Gravity's wages in 2015 and taking that drastic cut for yourself? Well, I started Gravity Payments. uh, I started building it when I was in high school. The inspiration initially was I grew up playing in a rock band in high school 
And there was a coffee shop owner named Heather who would let us use her coffee house as our venue since we were underage. And she was really incredible. And she was complaining to me one day about how just getting paid her money from her customers was costing her four, five, or even 6% of her revenue. And I really admired her. I appreciated that she made a venue for us. And also more importantly, she created a safe space for kids in our community. It was really incredible. Mm -hmm. And it was heartbreaking to see her being taken advantage of by these huge companies like Visa and MasterCard and the banks, taking from somebody who doesn't have much and giving it to those who have a lot. That didn't make any sense. So I started building Gravity Payments to level the playing field. And fast forward into 2015, and we had gone from having just a few customers to thousands of customers. And now I couldn't do what I did initially. Our first thousand clients, a majority of them I knew on a first name basis, and I could make sure that they were getting top-notch service, that they were being treated fairly. I couldn't do that on my own anymore. And having hundreds of people dedicated to doing that created a lot of success for us as a company. And I thought, well, we're still doing that. Shouldn't I get more money from it? So I had this million dollar paycheck when somebody else was making only $30,000 a year. And it dawned on me after a hike with a friend of mine who had had a $200 rent increase send her life into chaos, mm -hmm. that those employees making $30,000 a year, helping me create the value at Gravity Payments for our small business owners, help, helping them to just save money very quickly and easily on their credit card processing fees, mm -hmm. helping them to have the technology they needed to keep up with big companies like Starbucks. You know, we make technologies to allow independent coffee shops to do order ahead through our partner, Joe Coffee. All of this value, I realized, was not being created by me, which is what all the literature was telling me, which all the other CEOs, all the business books, Harvard Business School, everybody else, it was being created by the team. And I had to come to terms with that because our team was so dedicated to our small business customers Mm -hmm. that I really needed to make a change. I was going in the wrong direction. The inspiration was the fact that my vision that I was so excited about when I was a kid starting this company, I, want, I didn't want millions of dollars. I wanted to have all these small businesses get a better deal and have cheaper rates on their credit card processing. As simple and as boring as that sounds, that's what I wanted. And so when we created that together, it was incumbent on me. I think it was a moral imperative to share the resources that was creating, first and foremost with those small businesses, but then secondly with our employees. It's really wonderful to hear that when you were met with conflict, you returned to the initial intention and you saw that it was to create a solution to a problem, not be a part of the problem. And I wonder, you know, in retrospect, had you had a different motivation initially and you were just absorbing what the latest you know, CEO book was saying, if you would have maybe gone a different direction. It's just interesting to see how people and their moral compass and their values shine through in these times of difficulty. Unfortunately, yeah. Allison, there, there was a, a way to know that. And you're exactly right with your theory because I didn't start Gravity Payments alone. Mm. I started it with a business partner who didn't really care to help small businesses or employees. My business partner wanted to make the most money possible and get as much money and power as possible. And so in 2015, when I realized I was going in the wrong direction, after people started telling me things like, well, Dan, it's not your job to make sure people are making a livable wage, that's their job. And if they pick the wrong career path or the wrong job to apply for, that's not your responsibility. You don't even set their pay. The pay is set by the market. And so there are these compensation consultants that go around and say, this job should pay between this and this. And if you're a customer service person, even in an expensive place like Seattle, that might be somewhere between 15 and $20 an hour, which is not very livable, especially with the family in Seattle. So when I made the change, my business partner initially objected to it and said, you can't do that. And when I said, well, yes, I can, because I own a majority of the company and I have the voting rights, my business partner uh, sued me 
and I was dragged into a lawsuit for two years. Uh, there were kind of opposition research firms that were hired to try to dig up dirt on me and make me look bad in the public. Then when the lawsuit came and we had a three-week trial and the judge said Dan didn't do anything wrong at all, then it got appealed to the Court of Appeals and eventually the Supreme Court. So it ended up being a four or five year fiasco all around the idea of can a CEO and a business even do this stuff? Is it legal for us to even do this? Or do we have to have a company that is primarily motivated to create wealth for shareholders, which is an idea that started in the 70s or 80s and that has basically dominated all of our lives, even up until today, whether we know it or not. Speaking of how money correlates to quality of life and happiness, regarding the, the actual wage you decided to provide your employees, why was it 70000 What was the reasoning behind your base rate? And are there plans to adjust it in the future? I absolutely think we need to figure out a better strategy for it. I had read in many different books, it, there's this academic study. And the research won two Nobel Prizes, one for Daniel Kahneman and one for Angus Deaton. It's a 2010 Princeton study that shows that well-being increases with an increase in wage, which was, first of all, fascinating because there was always this debate of if you make more money, are you going to waste it or will you spend it to enhance your life and your well-being? So they solved that debate and showed that your well-being increases with more money. But then they also showed that once you get to a certain point, it stops and your well-being doesn't increase. And in their study at that time, it was $75,000. So I wanted to get as close as I could to that number. Now, that number was for a family, but it was also for a median family in kind of a median expense environment. So maybe that's more middle America compared to... Seattle or New York or LA or places like those. So it, it was a little bit fuzzy, but I asked that friend Valerie that I went on the hike that had the $200 rent increase. What do you think it would take for you to never feel stressed about money and to have whatever you need to, to take good care of yourself and have a little extra for emergencies, but then you know, you're kind of good. And so I talked to a few people, Valerie and others, and we, we kept coming up with this number. If you could make $70,000 a year, $1,400 a week, you know, like that seemed like the amount of money at that time that was needed to just kind of be okay, have everything be okay. The other thing that dictated the, the dollar amount was it was the absolute most we could afford at the time. And some of my CEO friends were really upset at me for taking a million dollar pay cut. And at that time, I was not necessarily advocating for pay cuts. I was more advocating to pay more for the people at the bottom. Right. And I wasn't advocating for any type of legal changes, systemic changes when it comes to you know our public policy. I was just saying, let's all kind of voluntarily pay people at the bottom more. The problem with that is it needs to come from somewhere. <laughs> and for one, every one person like me, or there were dozens of other entrepreneurs that were inspired by me that did the same thing, and we all flourished, we all did great, but there were so many more companies that were doing increasingly terrible things. And as you pointed out in 2008, companies used that as an opportunity to basically renegotiate permanently the deal and we're already hearing in this crisis how investors are saying, we want to take a bigger share of the pie if you want the money that we have to offer in this economy. And we want the workers and everybody else to get a smaller share of the pie. And so for every company that was doing the right thing, there were so many companies that were doing the wrong thing, but then maybe giving a little bit to charity to make up for it or doing things like that. And we companies that were doing the right thing, we didn't have a chance to make the difference we wanted to mm -hmm. in the macro environment outside of our workers, they were taken care of. But in terms of how does it affect everyday Americans out there or the even the existence of the American dream? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is quickly becoming extinct.
Yes, and that's a huge weight to bear once you kind of eschew your willful ignorance on a matter and you hold yourself accountable. As you're taking a look at yourself and you're recognizing how your dollar affects your neighbor's life um, seemingly indirectly at first, but when you really get down to it, everything is so interconnected and built. You know, the very fabric upon which we built the economic system is fraught with questionable tenets, we'll say, for the time being. So you spoke a little bit about how wages relate to happiness. I'm curious how they relate to productivity. Do higher wages increase productivity? And if so, or if not, what were some of the tangible changes you saw in your employees? Wages do increase productivity, but not for the reason people think. People think it's because people will be more motivated if they have higher wages. But actually, people with low wages are extremely motivated. And there was this huge debate of, are you going to take more motivation away from people? Are you going to give motivation? There's a, this obsession with motivation because people think that, oh, everyone's so lazy, they're only going to do enough to not get fired or to try to get a, a raise. But I ask people, look inside, are you only motivated to get a raise? Because most people, they say no. So I'm like, so you're a good person, but everybody else out there is a bad person, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, you got it, Dan. But it's not motivation. People are naturally motivated because they want to do a good job. They're doing something that they think matters, and they're trying to get better at it. And also, they want to fit in socially and be part of something bigger than themselves. So Motivation was not the problem. Our employees are motivated by helping small businesses, but the higher wages increased their capability because they didn't have the distractions of having financial situations that were creating emergencies for them and distracting them and pulling their attention away from their careers. Their capability was enhanced and also their license was enhanced. If you're making a livable wage, then you're more likely to step up and, and say like, I'm gonna take this on or make your voice heard and not feel so pressured. So the level of collaboration, intimacy, transparency that you need in 2020 to have a successful, fast moving, agile, quick performing startup, mm -hmm. you get those things. Motivation should come from the company doing good in the world. For us, we think small businesses are under siege. We think saving them money really quickly and like, 20 minutes of their time with like white glove service, we think that's an easy sell. We think giving them the technology to keep up with big businesses, we think that's an easy sell and it motivates us because we think those small businesses need those things and we want our small businesses to be happy and healthy because they make all of us happy and healthy. I mean, if you think of, I bet most your listeners would agree if they just walk around their community, like who, like what businesses really make them smile? It's a lot of small mom and pop businesses. So mm -hmm. we want to help those anything from plumbers to restaurants to retail shops to a garden center makes my girlfriend really happy. That's mm -hmm. like her favorite thing in life is a little garden center or some people it's like a little bookstore. So serving them provides all the motivation we could ever need. And we don't need money to motivate us, but we need it to not distract us or demotivate us. Mm -hmm. So if you pay everybody enough that they don't have to think about money, it increases their capability and license, and it might not motivate them, but it's not going to take away motivation or demotivate them anymore. When you explain it this way, of course, it's very easy for me to agree and say, yep, you're right. Blanket statement. I believe everything you say, but it doesn't mean that the yeah. media <laughs> or other business executives necessarily reacted the same way when you made your announcement and gave your case. How was the response? I'm sure it was across the board. So there was a lot of pushback and there were, there were a lot of different things thrown out there. But when a couple employees came out and said they didn't agree with the program, and then when my business partner sued me and those things were happening, there was one point where I checked Facebook and it said, oh, Gravity Payments and Dan Price are trending. And back then it used to tell you, oh, how many people are talking about you? And it was like millions of people. And I quickly scrolled through the comments and like nine out of 10 were people either with just people making fun of me and calling me a complete idiot and a loser and all that. So I had the distinct pleasure of having 3 million people at the same time making fun of me all at once. It was really a, it was, it was actually fine. It didn't bother me for some reason, 
because I knew that, you know, this is worth it. And it does kind of change the mold, but it's, it's something that is good, you know, for us. And at that time, I was thinking good for us. And I think I've learned over the last five years, it's not just good for us, but this should be a mandatory thing that everybody should do. It reminds me of the terror barrier whenever information comes in and it's it's a different, it causes a fracture in our own schema psychologically. You know, of course, our response is either to avoid it or deny it or scoff at it. And then you look at innovators and you go, oh, okay, so we made fun of you until we praised you. Yeah. And if we could just be a little more mindful of when we catch ourselves making fun of someone, recognizing that might be not only our future boss, but the person who changes things for the better for all of us. Like, let's give change a chance kind of thing, um, especially when your, your motivation and your approach are as tactful and with as much integrity as possible. Obviously, recognizing that so much of this is subjective. We all have very different opinions of what we think our economy should look like and how it should work. It helped me, too, to know that first and foremost, I was inspired by our customers, by those small businesses that I keep talking about. Secondly, by the fact that I had a team of people that were just inspired of those small businesses as me. And so I think that helped me to not really be personally offended too much because I knew that if this was going to work out, it wasn't going to be because I was brilliant. It was going to be because of the people around me. I guess an interesting way to say it is once you recognize the value of the team, you can also lean on them when you're receiving three million <laughs> pieces of rude information about yourself and go, all right, let's uh, spread the love, not pointing fingers or blaming, but like, please give me a shoulder I need to lean on right now. So I want to ask a, a couple more questions before we throw to a commercial. Let's talk the, uh, the wages that CEOs have been uh, giving themselves. CEO pay has grown almost a thousand percent in the last 40 years. And on average, they make 278 times the average worker. What has contributed to this massive pay divide? The people that create the value are the workers and the customers. Those are the job creators. Those are the wealth creators. But the people that decide how to split up that value are the executives and the investors. And so the executives and the investors basically have a deal with each other. The investors and the board say to the executives, if you're completely brutal in taking away all of the value and the jobs and the wealth that the everyday people are creating, if you just completely don't take them into consideration and you are willing to do things like lay off 20% of people that have dedicated their life to building this company without a second thought, we will become insanely wealthy as investors and we will give you five, 10, 15, or 20% of that wealth that you create by pillaging on our behalf to you as a CEO. So that's how the system is designed. The top benefactors of this are just wealthy individuals who are not CEOs who get the money as a result of that setup. But the people that are the gatekeepers that give them the money are the CEOs and the executives. And one time I was talking, it's, it's public, it's out there on YouTube if people want to look, but I was talking to Lorene Powell Jobs. She has $20 billion in net worth, and she is a delightful, wonderful, kind, compassionate human. But I was pushing her on the fact that her $20 billion actually goes to these executives and the executives do it to go back, give it back to her so that she can eke out a seven or eight or nine or 20% return on her money instead of a three, four, five or 10% return on her money. And they squeeze workers. And I said, Hey, you know, what's the responsibility that you have like in your place? And she said, well, I teach my kids that they shouldn't look at their value as human beings based on how wealthy they are. So that's kind of how I solve that. And I wish I would have had a little quicker mind and more courage at the time to say, well, maybe that solves it for your kids a little bit and for you a little bit, but morally and ethically, you are still contributing to like the destruction of the American dream of allowing people who maybe don't have so much money, an opportunity to have financial independence. And of course, you know, there's those one or two people that make it, 
but there are so many that don't make it. And another interesting thing that was said one time was Dean Baquette, who is the editor of the New York Times, asked Jay-Z, well, your kids aren't growing up in this horrible environment you were growing up in, so how are they gonna be so motivated and driven like you to become billionaires? Jay-Z said, most of my friends are either dead or in prison. I'm totally fine if my kids don't become billionaires. But even Jay-Z himself is, again, obsessed with the idea of him being a billionaire and him being more wealthy than the other hip-hop moguls and is, again, perpetuating the same system. So at some point, we have to stop looking at the Dan Price hero, the Jay-Z hero, and the Lorene Powell Jobs hero, and we actually have to vote, take back power for us as people maybe stop supporting companies like Amazon and Walmart and others that are exploiting workers, but ultimately that can only get us so far because those companies are quickly becoming monopolies where they're our only choice to engage in commerce the way we have to right now. And so, you know, I grew up in a conservative Christian Republican family and that was my ideology, but even me as a conservative Christian Republican am now saying, like, we have to provide healthcare for everybody. We have to have a wealth tax so that people actually have a ladder to climb up because right now we're basically just giving people no chance and then just hoping that they'll be okay. Yes. Do not get me started <laughs> on that. Like that's another episode. It's another episode, but it all is interrelated for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it really requires each of us, no matter where we're standing right now, to do a deep, deep look in the mirror and go inward and do things that are difficult, like risk our comfort and convenience, and even be open to altering the way our dreams can come to fruition. When I recognized that some of my dreams were perpetuating inequity or inequality, it was like, well, I can't, I can't reconcile that. I can't go to bed and, and be at peace knowing I'm doing this, so something's got to change. And at first, you're like, well, I don't know how else to do this, so I'll just try to justify my way through it. But, you know, if you're willing, and I, I hope everyone listening and watching that you, you are willing to examine yourself and then say, creativity is infinite. There are always solutions. There are always ways of going beyond what we're currently doing and optimizing it so that everyone can come to the table and have a seat. It's difficult because we've created a fun little maze and like a labyrinth for ourselves. So we're going to hit a lot of dead ends. It's going to take trying to figure out where we even are in the middle of the maze and then finding different pathways out, but it is doable. That um, is so, so well said, Allison. So um, well said. Oh, good. Woohoo! <laughs> learning something, learning something slowly and surely. So one question before we throw to break, why is providing a livable wage important? What are some of the concrete substantial benefits to employees and employers? And do you feel it's your responsibility to foster and protect this dynamic? It's health and well-being, which we talked about, but mm -hmm. some examples that we saw compared to five years ago, because we're a perfect experiment to show this. So prior to 70K, prior to us setting the, the starting wage at 70K, we had at our company between zero and two babies born per year. We've had 50 in the past five years. Oh we had word. 15 just last year. Wow. So that's an example of people really leaning into the human experience. And I know, you know, having kids is not for everybody. I'm not trying to say that. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden you give people choices and they start to make choices. We went from having zero first time homeowners. And again, home ownership isn't for everybody. That's fine. To having dozens of first time homeowners at the company. We had 70% of the people at the company report either getting completely out of debt and going debt free or substantially paying down debts and people doubled or even tripled their retirement savings. Mm -hmm. So these are all proof of like how it actually works. A lot of people said, if you give somebody a raise like that, they'll just squander it. They'll spend it on something worthless. We proved that isn't the case. And I was getting ready to launch a book called Worth It before COVID-19 showing and proving that that worked and also that our revenue and, and processing volume and number of customers, all those things, but our revenue tripled in those five years. 
So it worked for us as a company. Now somebody might say, well, your revenue might've tripled anyway, even if you didn't do that. That's true. I don't know what would have happened exactly, but look at the before versus the after and look at how well it worked. And so I think in the one case scenario, you could say, oh, it caused our revenue to triple. But at a minimum, you could say, we were able to keep thriving and keep growing mm -hmm. in spite of that increased cost. And we are able to provide a good life that was more broadly shared. And I'll say for myself, I went from having no money to being a multimillionaire in my 20s. In my 30s, my net worth has not gone up at all. It's gone, if anything, down. And I am way happier, way healthier. I did not have a six pack in my 20s on a good day. Now I have a little mini one. You know, like my life has never, never, never been better than it was at least before the crisis. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think that all this wealth hoarding, it's not helping the people at the top. And the analogy that I would ask people to think about is how would we feel if somebody took a thousand N95 masks and kept them to themselves as one person, when my sister in real life, who is a nurse, does not have an N95 mask right now every day to wear at work, how would we feel about that? Because that's the exact same way that our companies and our corporation, our society is treating money, which is required for well being in our system. Wow, that's exquisitely stated and very poignant given the current environment. I wanted to discuss further these kind of lavish lifestyles within the tech industry and then also how the recession is going to impact us all. But first, let us take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking with Dan Price about the importance of livable wages and why more companies need to adopt new salary policies. Let's take a moment to, to dive into these executive lifestyles. It seems like everyone in the tech elite is driving the latest and greatest Tesla model, posing with their private jet, lounging around their infinity pools. As a young tech entrepreneur, you shared a little bit how your lifestyle has changed now that new salaries are implemented. Do you also experience a shift in values or do you ever feel like it threatens your trajectory as a business person? It's true that I was, you know, in some pretty crazy situations in my 20s when I was living kind of that lifestyle. My, uh, my flavor of it was jumping out of helicopters in Alaska to like snowboard down these like peaks that you could never imagine getting to any other way other than with a helicopter. And then also, you know, having poker matches with tens of thousands of dollars, you know, moving just from one person to another. And, you know, these crazy wild trips to Las Vegas and pick places like that where people are going to spend, I mean, I literally have witnessed somebody spending a half million dollars in a matter of one night just on a night out in Vegas. So you see all those things, but I think what they prove to me more than anything else is that it's not all it's cracked up to be. And that if anything, it's more of kind of like a consumer illusion and it's really not meaningful. It's not helpful uh, at a human level. It's not helpful for any type of long-term sustainable happiness. It does feed your ego. So if you're primarily motivated to feed your ego, then trying to get up on the Forbes list or trying to have the wildest night out possible definitely makes some sense. But I think if you're trying to be you know, health, healthy, happy, and whole as a human being, then yes, it is your responsibility to make enough money or try to make enough money to support yourself. And unfortunately, that's getting harder and harder for a lot of people. But as a CEO or as a business person, it's like historically easy to get to that level because the table is so tilted in your direction. Mm -hmm. So I think at that point, it, for, for all of your listeners that are in that situation, that do have a relatively easy time making enough money to care for themselves, if they really care about themselves, they got to go up a little bit in terms of Maslow's hierarchy and where they're thinking if they want their health and their well-being to be improved, if they care about their own vitality, and they need to think about how to share that systemically with the people around them. I mean, with coronavirus, if you have impeccable hygiene, but everybody else has poor hygiene, you're going to get it and you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same thing with financial hygiene. And so what we've done is we've said, well, the people at the top you know, they're somewhat going to get more, other people are going to get less, but then they have to continue to build more and more barriers to try to protect themselves from the fact that they've kind of made things worse for everyone else. 
that happens in society, but it also happens inside of a company. And so I think, hope, I hope what we're gonna see and what we would naturally see if it weren't for things like monopolies is those companies doing that having a competitive advantage. So, you know, with the crisis that we're facing right now, our employees self-organized and decided they didn't want anyone laid off. They didn't want anyone to take a, a, a pay cut that was forced mm -hmm. and promoted the idea of people voluntarily taking pay cuts to save jobs. I've never heard of an, that happening ever in the history of the world at a company, uh, employees doing that. Mm. And that type of agility from the entire broad spectrum of different roles as a company over time will be a competitive advantage. But unfortunately, the Amazons and the Facebooks and the Starbucks, the people with all the money, they use their advantage to basically buy influence in politics and also create uh, like technology differences so that other people can't compete and they can be a monopoly and they don't really have to worry about competition. Mm -hmm. That's what we're up against. And I honestly don't know who's gonna win that struggle, but I know that I'm happy to be on this side of it. And I'm betting you that Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and all those other people are actually suffering being on the other side. Because when you're fighting not for what's right, but what's wrong, it affects your vitality greatly. Well stated. And as you're talking, I'm thinking of all of the small businesses who are rallying together. And, you know, I'm, I'm alongside the fight and I know people um, who are listening. We have a lot to think about in the ways that we're interacting with online markets now that we're stuck at home. And where are we going for these convenient needs that we, we think we need, but they're actually just commodities and conveniences. So research done by the Fiscal Policy Institute found that between 98 and 2001, the number of small business establishments grew at a rate of 3.1% in states with higher minimum wages compared with a rate of 1.6% in states with lower minimum wages, which seemed to disprove rumors that higher wages definitively harm uh, small business. How do you think increasing minimum wage affects small businesses and how can we protect them while also protecting the workers? I think it needs to be looked at as part of a package. So I think having a higher minimum wage is a good thing if we do the right things to protect small business owners. The top two crunches, the top two things that put somebody out of business or cause somebody to not even start a business in the first place are number one, lack of money, lack of financial means. Mm -hmm. And number two, lack of health care mm -hmm. or lack of ability to provide health care for others. Right. So if we had, for example, a Medicare for all system, one thing that we could do in, during the pandemic is we could immediately institute emergency Medicare for all for everybody who's self-employed and all, all companies up to 500 or 1,000 employees. And that would give us kind of a stepping stone to get there for everybody. But the big businesses, the reason why they don't want everyday people to have health care and the reason why they spend all that money to not have it, it gives them an advantage. It creates an unlevel playing field because big businesses have an easier time providing health care. They have a bigger pool for their employees than the small business owners. And so if you took that health care burden away from small business owners, they would be able to do much better to provide a livable wage or to have mm. to absorb a, a higher minimum wage. And also, if you had a wealth tax and a progressive uh, VAT tax where wealthy people weren't able to avoid taxes, I mean, just recently, Facebook, they literally put $9 billion of taxes outside by claiming that Facebook essentially was invented in Ireland and the Caribbean and not in California or New York. And they're gonna win because they have good um, lobbyists who have set up the laws to make sure that they can't be held accountable for doing that sort of thing. And then they got credit for delivering whatever a couple hundred thousand masks to somebody that they had stashed away with their $9 billion. So as long as we have that system, small businesses are under pressure and they can't absorb a higher minimum wage. If you took that pressure off of small businesses, they would be happy to pay their employees more. And states that have a higher minimum wage, they also have other policies 
that protect small businesses more than those other states. Mm. And so there's multiple factors in place there. I feel for small business owners because they do feel like they're being crushed by a higher minimum wage, but it's because of all those other systemic factors. And then the larger companies and the wealthy people can get the small business owners politically on their side by pressuring them in that way. And if you've ever heard of a book called Dark Money by Jane Mayer, she writes for the uh, New Yorker, you know, she kind of talks about how uh, these billionaires will literally put like $100 million into a political initiative that will make them $10 billion. They'll make 100 or 1,000 times their money setting up these schemes, and they just look at it as oh, like a strict ROI. A dream, yeah. And literally, like regular people are dying, becoming homeless, losing their physical, mental, and emotional health as part of that grand poker game, and we're mm -hmm. all just poker chips in the game. Right. Yeah, we use the term monopoly to describe businesses, but then also we think of it in terms of the game and feeling like we are just pieces on a board being propped around and puppeted. And it's an intense situation. And that's why we're having this conversation to build, you know, overall public education and awareness of what the factors are. And then we can now go and do our own further research. If we were to implement uh, livable wages on a wider scale, how does that end up affecting the economy in terms of consumer spending? I think it, it would greatly impact, um, in a positive way, people's ability to have more choice. Because right now, if you are making just the absolute minimum that you need to get by, and Walmart has the lowest price, or Amazon saves you the most amount of time, you have to go with those options. Mm -hmm. So those large companies are benefited. If you have a little bit extra, you're gonna make a choice to support a small business that more aligns to your values, and then that small business makes more revenue. So if you put more money into the hands of everyday consumers, who again, people are good. I think we misunderstand this. At their core, people are good. They act poorly because we know we're part of this game, we don't like it, and we're super angry about it. So like I was like, you know, driving the other day and somebody cut me off and then honked at me and flipped me off. And like that person's not a bad person. They're angry, rightfully so. And they're directing it, you know, I would argue at the wrong person, but you know, it's, they're not wrong to be angry right now. And if we can alleviate some of those pressures that we're putting people under, then they can make better choices, support, you know, the, the American dream, support small businesses, and, and then that will allow those small businesses to flourish. But it is tough because the small business is not getting those advantages. And when you increase their cost of labor, it is tricky for them. And just to be clear, can you help us understand the difference between livable and minimum and why you focus on livable? A, a minimum wage is kind of like a, a mandatory thing that's like what's going to be legal. And I think that we need to try to increase that. But then the livable wage is basically like where it needs to be to have this equilibrium that I'm shooting for. Now, should the minimum wage go all the way up to that livable wage or should it go 95% of the way there? So I don't have a, a very like, you know, defined opinion on like exactly what it needs to be, but it should be as close as possible to that amount where like everybody's okay. And one thing that's crazy is if we just divided up the resources in a fair way that actually truly allocates it to the people that are creating the jobs, are creating the wealth, are creating the prosperity, everybody could be making, I would say, at least $50,000 a year that is you know, willing to work hard and, and do the right things, which is virtually everybody out there. I mean, mm. we have this narrative in our head that's been set up by the people that are in power right now, that if you're not making enough, it's your fault and it's a character flaw. And right. the reason why that narrative exists is because it's a very profitable thing for them. And then we have people that are literally being hurt by them attacking me for fixing that because that message is so powerful. And Frank Luntz is a guy who's like a pollster and he like measures people and he figures out what messages can he sell on behalf of billionaires to the general public. And I sometimes get a preview of those messages because I'm in some of those circles. And I've had really good people that are my friends that don't make a lot of money say an exact 
phrase that Frank Lunt said like a year ago because, you know, he understands his ability to divide us and get us fighting each other is the best defense against us recognizing our own power and our own value in this situation. Mm -hmm. And so all of these like differences of like, you know, politics and everything, the divisiveness, and I'm all for civil rights for everybody. I'm all for individual liberties for everybody. So I want to make that clear. But like the fighting that we do when it, it really is becoming as the um, founder of PayPal and basically the founder of Facebook, Peter Thiel wrote in his book, Zero to One, the way they see the world is it's billionaires. Those are the only people that matter. And everybody else, we're all in the same category to them. And so we have to recognize that if we don't recognize it, we're powerless to do anything to change it. I'm going to have to listen and re-listen to that bit several times because that's... Uh... They asked the Dalai Lama one time, they said, how would you create peace on earth? And he said, alien invasion. Like We would all unite if there was an alien invasion. It, like, And that's... That's basically like the situation here. Like we all need to recognize that most of what's ailing us is just coming from the ultra wealthy. I'm not talking about millionaires. For the most part, the millionaires are kind of like it's also somewhat powerless. It's really coming from only the billionaires. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fighting that we do about social issues, about everything, those fights are designed almost like a video game simulation for us to do by the billionaires. So they get to watch us while they're eating popcorn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we play out the movie as they want it to go. You weathered the 2008 financial crisis, which affected gravity when it took a 20% hit to revenue. What did you learn from that experience and how are you preparing to weather this economic climate differently? Number one is your people are your biggest asset. It's a cliche but 99% of companies don't actually buy into it. They say it, but if you look at their actions, they don't believe in it, but it's mm -hmm. true. Your people really are your greatest asset. So therefore we have to treat everybody like human beings and give everybody full information about what's going on. So that was our first thing was to get everybody all the information we have to be completely transparent, even in a vulnerable way. Everyone's like, oh, you're gonna scare people. Like you should tell them what to think and control them. It's like, no give them all the information there is, and then solicit solutions from your people. Cause your people are your, they're your salvation in a situation like this. Mm. They really are. And so that was first and foremost, get everybody all the information, get on the same page. Let's try to help each other get our feet on the ground and understand what the reality of the situation is. Number two, how are you going to weather those initial shocks so that you don't go out of business in the early days of the crisis? Work on that together as a, as a team. And that's where our team came together and said, hey, we're gonna take the hit on this one, but we're, we're not gonna distribute it that hit evenly because some people can afford to take a hit and other people can't, and we don't mm -hmm. wanna leave anybody behind. So you know, somebody could say, well, maybe that person made a bad financial decision. Why should I be accountable to that? That's blame. Blame does not help you in a crisis. What helps you is a focus on results and the future. And I just asked the team, hey, there were 10 million people laid off in the, ne in the last two weeks. How many people do we want to send into that line at the unemployment office? And the resounding answer was zero. We want to send zero people into that line. And then number three, that's the longest phase. If you get the first two phases right, then you get the chance to go to phase three. If you don't get number one and two right, you never even get to phase three. Phase three is how we're going to grow out of it. Right. We have 20,000 small business clients. They are forever squeezed and forever changed. And that is heartbreaking from this situation. But in order for us to be sustainable, because right now we have families and people that are going into debt because they just volunteer to take a pay cut. We have the company that's going into debt because we're losing money every single day, every single second, we're losing money. We need to get back to sustainability. We have to go from 20,000 small businesses that we're helping and that love us to having 35 or 40,000 small businesses that we're helping that love us. We've never added 15 or 20,000 small businesses as clients in a year before. We have doubled in a year, but it was when we were much smaller. So the challenge that we have in front of us is almost completely impossible. 
And I feel so good about it because we have 200 people that all understand the situation, are all pulling their weight, are all doing everything they can. And I've never been more proud or confident in my team ever in my life than I am right now. So what do you think the future holds or what would you like for it to hold? I would like us to overcome that and to get to those 35 or 40,000 customers before we run out of money. So we, that's going to be about a year before we run out of money. Best case scenario, if we, if we absorb a few more punches, we could have less time than that. But if that's not possible, I want to find a way to protect all the people and our customers. And if we're going to go down, I want to go down with our integrity intact. So the number one thing is having our integrity intact. First choice is to have our integrity intact and succeed. Second choice is to have our integrity intact and fail. And losing our integrity in this situation for us is not an option because we are helping heroes. We're helping small businesses. We're helping them save money. That matters. And we just want to be able to keep doing that for those small businesses. If we bail ourselves out by giving up our integrity, then we're just giving up. We might as well fail. That's very admirable and very needed in a time like this. So then how can we support you, whether that's you personally or what you would hope all of us take away from this and go and and learn on our own? In this crisis, the world needs each of us more than ever before. Like each of us as individuals can make a bigger difference right now than ever before. And it's a heartbreaking situation. I ball my eyes out for about a half hour every day, but the other 23 and a half hours, like I'm ready to fight. And what gravity needs is basically for people to ask their dentist, their, you know, the place where they buy construction supplies, um, their plumber, their restaurant, even if they're closed, because we can give them the technology solutions they need to compete, or we can very simply, very quickly, easily with good service, save them money so that when they are back up and running, they'll be making more profit and be able to replenish either the savings that they've lost or the debt that they've accumulated getting through the crisis. So we just need people out there to connect us with one, two, three small business owners in one of those fields or any other fields. We work a lot with veterinarians, you know, we work with coffee shops, like basically anybody that accepts a lot of credit cards that's not selling like porn, gambling or drugs, like Mm -hmm. we we can help. And if everybody out there can connect us with one, two or three businesses, you know, literally we will make it. And if they don't, then we might not. Said with uh, stoicism and an acceptance that I think is, um, it's really admirable and it's where we are, accepting what is and being non, non-judgmental and also non-attached and trusting that no matter what, there will be a way out through somehow and you'll have quite a team around you to get to weather the conditions and get through it together. And that's, uh, that's really unique and, and remarkable. So if, if we make it out of this too, we'll have probably one of the best stories to tell for the rest of our lives. And that's not lost on us. We're really excited about that. Hold on to that story and we'll be rooting for you and we'll be, uh, you know, signing up to support as well and to help write the chapters so that everything is looking up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for making time and, and sharing your wisdom and knowledge and allowing us to peer into how you're handling this and what we can do to be better pieces of the solution. Allison, I, Allison, uh, I, I really love listening to your show. So it's a thrill to be on it. And thank mm-hmm. you for what you do in connecting these really difficult concepts uh, so that all of us, whether it's not our field of expertise or not, so that we can understand it. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'll let you go so you can go uh, contribute to saving the world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let's stay in touch too. Let me know if you ever need anything. Thank you. Likewise. Okay, we've arrived at the time for this week's mantras. Instead of just providing statements this round, I'm actually going to ask a few questions. So these can help transform the way we think about life, work, and the world we live in. Um, Feel free to write them down, set a reminder, and repeat them regularly. I will read each twice. On the third, I'll remain silent so you have the opportunity to repeat the mantra or question for yourself. Let's begin. Success might be an option, failure might be an option, but compromising my integrity is never an option. Success might be an option, failure might be an option, but compromising my integrity is never an option.
great. And next, am I serving humanity or serving my ego? Am I serving humanity or serving my ego? And lastly, how can I actualize my power in this pandemic? How can I actualize my power in this pandemic? Excellent. And I would absolutely love if you would DM me those answers to those questions if you feel comfortable. Or better yet, skip the DM and act on it. And then tell me after you've acted on it, uh, what you experienced actualizing your power and serving the folks who are living next to us and in the same communities, countries, and on the same planet. Um, we are truly in this together. And as Dan said, each of us needs to step into the fullness of who we are more than ever. So thank you for listening and hanging out with us today. If you know someone who could be positively affected by this episode, inspired, motivated, please do share it with them and make sure if you haven't already to leave a rating and review with your favorite takeaway from today. I'll see you next time for more simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Stay safe, stay healthy. Peace.